Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and I just got a call from the uh, freight. They're going to be delivering everything that was in the uh, fulfillment. Uh, the fulfillment they they kept an inventory, you know, of extra stuff from geez, like two years of uh, projects. So by tomorrow, all printed material from Splato Comics will be in this warehouse. Like everything, it's supposed to be like eleven hundred pounds. They were they were uh, asking. Can an 18-wheeler get into your neighborhood? <laughs> it's like, that's going to be a no. Uh, but um, And then they actually narrowed it down to a, like a two-hour window. I was very, very impressed. Um, now the question is, is it going to be a giant pallet just dropped in my driveway? Or will they be able to you know get into the garage? Uh, we'll see. So then uh, Narwhal uh, just sent me the final PDF for $4.99. I'm going to check that right afterwards. And then get on to checking the Expendables Go to Hell print file. So very, very exciting day. So Tim did this uh, tweet. It's here on the screen. The tweet was actually accompanied with a cover, but the cover was confusing because it shows a new Bucky, but that storyline wasn't really about a new Bucky. It was about introducing someone who was going to replace him as Captain America. And that even gets more complicated because lots of people are watching uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier and they're getting the alternate version. It's funny, the TV version, like the comic book version is like, oh, this guy was in the military and then he became a professional wrestler and then uh, he was the, uh, the Captain America and then uh, Captain America was the captain, but then he was the captain, and then he was US agent. And now like with this and with like Bullseye in uh, the Daredevil Netflix TV show, they're always just like, yeah, so he was a vet. And they just they just simplify the backstory for uh he was a vet. Uh that's it. And he went crazy. Uh but um so Tim puts out this, you know, and he says, you know, uh this is the last time I ever want to hear that, you know, comics should not be political. So um I feel like I've done this video twenty times. It's probably like ten or twelve. It feels like twenty. So when you do a response, there's two things. There's doing a response to what he actually said, pretending as if he actually believes it. And then there's the response of, why did you do this and who was this for? New comics are now the least popular things in comic book stores. You used to say that people would walk past them, but it's kind of a trick question because from what I see, when the new comics get diminished, they start getting pushed farther and farther back into the store. Sometimes literally, I remember one place, um, it was literally the farthest back corner to the left. Um, so uh, who is Tim saying this for? Well, he's saying this to appease 12 psychos on Twitter and six really bitter um, uh, editors who hold grudges. That's who it's for. I don't believe Tim as a middle-aged fairly intelligent man, actually thinks that when people say we don't want politics in comics, that we're going to the extreme of we don't want any politics ever for any reason in even a high quality story. Never, ever. No, come on. Stop. Stop acting like a baby brained imbecile. Stop acting like you're as stupid as the people you're trying to appease. When I and other people say Phrases to the effect of, we don't want politics in comics. It means we don't want politics constantly in comics and it to almost always be the same type of, of politics, which is left to far left. I brought up a favorite writer a million times, Anne Nascenti. I'll give you a hint. She's not a Republican. She is a far left Democrat and if it was in Europe, I, she might even be on the socialist platform. But she was able to write stories that had politics as a theme, as a thread, as a plot element in them. And I would say about 90% of the time, uh, she could do it in a way that uh, didn't make anyone feel bad. It was pretty obvious, you know, you didn't have to read tea leaves to, you know, deduce that she was left to far left. But she was also able to be professional and show different sides to a story. One of my favorite ones is she would talk about feminism and environmentalism. And she had two characters. Um, one was like a Stepford wife, you know, blonde, tall, supermodel, kind of an airhead. 
and then one was this, you know, environmental activist. And she constantly made the point that the environmental activist, while pretending to care so much, was actually a very bitter, mean person who literally was a trustafarian. She lived off of her father's money while, you know, pretending to fight against him. And the Stepford wife, while being, you know, kind of brainwashed, was a legitimately kind person who helped others um, and uh, did that uh, with, without wanting anything in return, without patting herself on the back. You don't really see that type of stuff much anymore, barely at all. Um, so uh, to reiterate, although Tim knows this just fine. When people say they don't want politics in comics, they say they don't want politics constantly in comics. And of the politics that is put there, they don't want it to constantly be of the left to far left. Now, he's referencing a story that had a lot of depth to it. It was very hard to, you know, rubber stamp and say, this is the good guy, this is a bad guy, because Mark Grunewald would have characters do the wrong thing for the right reasons, the right thing for the wrong reasons. He would show them evolve over time. He would show them, you know, wanting to change. John Walker was presented as, you know, the cooler, tougher version of uh, Captain America. He ain't no liberal wimp, although it's kind of funny. Like, still in the 1980s, we had what I called the James Garner Democrat. And that was like, I'm a Democrat, but I'm not a wimp. Uh, James Garner was a... Well, kind of funnily, he played like a coward hero. A coward hero was like this 70s trope where he would try to kind of like talk his way out of trouble or even run away. But when he could fight, he could actually fight. James Garner was a Korean War vet, combat veteran. Um, so he was a legitimate, actual tough guy. Grew up very poor. And back then it was kind of, you know, more simple. You know, you grew up poor, you were a Democrat. Even when he became rich, he, that didn't change that he grew up poor. So he was still a Democrat. And, you know, you'd be like, oh, you know, Republicans, that's just the party for the rich. Uh, and um, but he wasn't a complete wimp. He was very patriotic about his country. Uh, he was very active, you know, put his money where his mouth was. And again, he wasn't a wimp. He wasn't some soy boy, you know, tossing a Molotov into the Apple store in Portland. You know what I mean? Uh, so um, it was kind of almost like that, but more over the top. It was like a James. So Captain America, Steve Rogers. He was usually portrayed in the, you know, James Garner Democrat style. You know, they call it New Deal, but most people, you know, that aren't 50 don't know what that means. Um, and then John Walker was presented more as like a Rambo, you know, aggressive, tough guy. But then very quickly, it was shown that John Walker had some mental issues that he would really go over the top and start killing people when you didn't need to. And basically everyone was like, hey, we liked him when he was a tough guy. We don't like him when he's a crazy guy. I mean, you didn't really, you could have detained those people. You didn't need to kill them. Mark Grunewald didn't hammer it over your head that this is the point where you should no longer like John Walker. It went from, oh, this is a really interesting character. Hey, I kind of like this take on Captain America to, oh, he goes too far. I see what you're saying. I want Steve Rogers back. And it was a way to make you appreciate Steve Rogers. It was, a, it was another way to show you that Steve Rogers doesn't just blindly follow orders that he will do what's right even when he was told that it's wrong even when he has to go be an outlaw so that's a good story here's the deal everyone likes the john walker the captain slash u.s agent storyline everyone likes it republicans like it democrats like it liberals like it conservatives like it everyone likes it because it was a rich story with depth I was recently reading an article with Mark Grunewald, and it's very clear that he was, you know, a Democrat. I don't know if he was necessarily that liberal, but he was definitely a Democrat. And I think he even said one joke. He's like, you guys didn't think I was going to make the Republican the hero, did you? But it was done in a light tone, and he kind of moved on from that joke. It wasn't hammering it. We don't want your politics hammered into our head. Uh, if you want to present yours along with others, you know, a la carte, and we can kind of choose what we believe. Oh, you know what? You're actually convincing me. I would say I'm more to this, you know, type of uh, uh, belief on this subject. That's fine. Uh, but again, I'm sure that Tim knew this. What this has done is to appease 12 psychos on Twitter and six very bitter, vengeful editors who hold grudges and keep tabs of people's politics. When you say stuff like this, it will make your life easier with about 
18 assholes who are just looking for reasons to hurt people. But in these very divisive times, you also being divisive doesn't help anyone except for maybe yourself temporarily. And as Jimmy Pomiati says, when he goes into the store, I wasn't quite sure if he co-owns that store or if he just rents some office space there. But when you have a situation where new comics are the least popular items in comic book stores, maybe find a better way to say this. Anyway, thanks for watching. And if you are backing any of my crowdfunding campaigns, there is a lot of movement, especially this week. Thanks for watching. Bye.